Good afternoon and welcome to the Faculty Forum online broadcast, which allows MIT alumni to interact with our faculty experts about their cutting edge research and ti on timely topics. <coughs> Excuse me, I am Judy Cole, the EVP and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I will be your moderator today. To participate, first put a username and your location, then simply type your question in at the bottom of your screen. While we will not be able to cover every question over the next half hour, we will do our best to get to as many as possible. Our speaker today is Professor Chapel Chap Lawson from MIT's Department of Political Science and the director of the MISTI program, that's the MIT uh, International Science and Technology Initiatives program. First, I will ask Professor Lawson to uh, say a few words about his work and what he's going to talk to us about today. Thank you. Enormously flattering, this notion of cutting edge research <laughs> on timely issues. That's great. That's what every academic aspires to. Uh, I worked very briefly in the Department of Homeland Security as a senior director for, uh, well, for uh, policy and planning at U.S. Customs and Border Protection and as an advisor to the commissioner of that agency. And in that capacity, I guess my responsibilities ranged from somewhere between uh, making sure the Xerox machine was full of paper and <laughs> high-level high strategic discussions of, of U.S. borders. And I was an academic at MIT before that, and now I'm back here mm -hmm. at MIT. Can you start by telling us a little bit about what the Department of Homeland Security is and what it does? I'm not sure a, most of us really know. Right, and it's in some ways sort of a misnomer because the Department of Homeland Security doesn't do homeland security in the sense of counterterrorism. That's really the province of the FBI and the intelligence community. What the Department of Homeland Security does is border protection, border enforcement, trade flows in and out of the United States, immigration, how people who are legal permanent residents become permanent citizens of the United States, and of course the Secret Service, that is protection of the president, natural disasters, that's FEMA. But it's really a cobbled together collection of different agencies um, in charge of mainly border-related issues. Mm -hmm. and, and I worked at the largest component of uh, Homeland Security, which is called Customs and Border Protection. It's a 58,000-person agency that has three pieces, one of which is the Border Patrol, one of which is basically Customs, and one of which is the Office of Air and Marine, meaning that we had our own Air Force and Navy. Oh, you mean... The Office of Customs and Immigration has their own Air Force and Navy? U.S. Customs and Border Protection has six predators that oh. patrol the southwest border of the United States and the littorals, among, among other so things. So not are, controlled by the military? No, separately controlled by Homeland Security. These are not the predators with, with uh, missile systems attached. Yeah. These yeah, are yeah. just watching the border and policing it from the air. Fascinating. Yeah. So what do you see as the most pressing national security issues in the United States today? This is a timely question given the campaign. <laughs> yes. uh, something I, I worked briefly on while I was at, at CBP is, is Mexico. Uh, obviously, some people argue that Mexico is a failed state, mm -hmm. that it's collapsing at a fantastic pace. Other people say it's basically OK. It's, it's Mexico as it's always been. And border management with Mexico is obviously a huge issue mm -hmm. because one of the things that's, in theory, destabilizing Mexico is the flow of illegal drugs, mm. right? I Northwood. just heard something this weekend about, a, and I, I have to imagine it was enormous, a tunnel being built under that border somewhere in California that was funneling drugs into the United States. Yeah, near, near Tijuana, and this is one of a series of tunnels that has been found over mm -hmm. the last 10 years. But there's every possible route to smuggling drugs into the United States, and I should say also smuggling arms from the United States into Mexico. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. is a symbiotic two-way trade Mm -hmm. for which the United States, I think, bears some measure of culpability. So mm -hmm. our, our goal should be to engage with Mexico mm -hmm. as much as they will let us, as much as humanly possible, to clamp down on this two-way contraband trade. Yeah. And in, in that way, hope to stabilize Mexico as much as possible. And are those tunnels also used for human for hum traffic as well? For human trafficking and for illegal immigration, although yeah. I think in this case it was mainly marijuana smuggling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a, just part of a broader issue that I know you probably will get to, but uh, a lot of people think that illegal immigration can be stopped by enhancing security at the border. And illegal immigration is really not about border security. Mm. Obviously, the American people have to feel some measure of security, that, that the border is not entirely porous to illegal immigration. But really, it's about domestic enforcement. It's about mm. making sure that someone who employs a gardener 
or someone who owns a textile factory or a Walmart doesn't employ people who are illegally in the United States. That's the best deterrent against illegal immigration. And what policies can one implement that will actually accomplish that? Because yeah, don't we have some deterrent laws uh, on the books already? We have laws on the books. They're very difficult to enforce. And one of the reasons it's so hard to enforce is because it's, it's very difficult to prove that an employer deliberately hired somebody who was illegal mm. or should have not. So some system of electronic verification that allows mm. an employer to say, rapidly this person is eligible or this person is not eligible mm -hmm. that that's that's and and have that system be sufficiently easy to use and reliable that people will actually employ it mm -hmm. and um, that people will be deterred from uh, even applying for jobs if they're illegal in the United States so can I just say one more thing because absolutely that's the first piece and I don't want you to think it's all enforcement there are 11 million people in the United States here illegally mm -hmm. and we're not going to deport them all so there has to be some plan for regularizing that group of people, giving them legal status in the United States. And then the, the last piece is really ensuring that there's a, f a plan for managing future flows. Mm -hmm. But the immigration is not going to stop in the United States. It's not going to stop just because we passed a comprehensive immigration reform. We're going to need some plan to make sure that people can continue to enter the United States to fulfill our labor needs. Right? That, so that, that constellation of things is what we need for comprehensive yeah. Now, another issue that occurs to me is where does, where does the federal responsibility for immigration control intersect with states' responsibility? That's a great question. Because wasn't there just a recent issue with, I think, Alabama or one of the southern states? Certainly Passing Arizona. laws that yeah. were more stringent than... Than those of the federal government. Yeah. It's a very difficult issue because obviously a lot of states or some people in states feel like uh, the federal government is not doing enough, but mm -hmm. ultimately this is a federal issue. I mean, Alabama mm -hmm. doesn't have its own immigration policy, and neither does Arizona. Right. 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 So you recommend uh, trying to reduce illegal drugs, drug demand in a group of heavy users, people on parole, probation, or in prison. What do you suggest? This is a great question because in some ways it's analogous to the illegal immigration issue. Right? The, the, yeah. the, the best way to control illegal drug use in the United States is not by trying to catch things at the border. <laughs> we have 11.3 million containers that arrive by sea into the United States every year, plus millions more by land. We're not going to find every kilogram of cocaine right, in those shipments. What we need to do is, is change domestic demand mm -hmm. by, by focusing on the demand reduction. And right. one of the biggest users, one of the biggest groups of users in the United States are people already under the tutelage of our gentle criminal justice system. <laughs> so people on probation, people on parole, people in prison. Those mm. are some of the biggest users of illegal drugs. And in theory, we should be able to control the amount of illegal drugs they have access to, since we already, in a sense, have them under law enforcement scrutiny. Theoretically control their environment. So the theoretically. How, why is that breaking down? I mean, that's, that's I think, the question, yeah, really. No, that's an, incredibly, that's an incredibly challenging question. It gets to the issues of prison reform in the United States and mm -hmm. outsourcing of prisons to private entities. It also gets at the, the fact that that end of the criminal justice system, parole, probation, has not really been working well in a number of dimensions. But, but there is a separate set of users. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, there are hardcore drug users, we call them addicts, mm -hmm. who could be handled differently than we handle them now. Yes. Uh, in some countries, those people are registered yep. with authorities and they actually receive treatment mm -hmm. right, in a systematic way. And then there are casual users. I mean, if we were very serious about uh, combating drug use in the United States, we probably would have police officers in the men's rooms of <laughs> clubs in mm -hmm. South Florida on Saturday night, right? R right, rather than trying to do everything uh, at the border itself, right? It's, it's politically sometimes more expedient to say, well, let's throw another 500 border patrol agents at the southwest border, mm -hmm. rather than taking the more difficult measures on the domestic front. Certainly. <clears throat> so let me turn and take some questions from um, some of our alumni, we have Jim in Michigan asking, what role can technology play in helping governments maintain the integrity of their borders? This is, Jim, that's a, that's a great question because there's been a huge investment in technology all along the southwest border. That's sort of the area between the ports of entry. Between the ports of entry, that's really easy, because it, at least conceptually, because everything between the ports of entry is illegal. Nothing coming in between, say, uh, El Paso and the next city over in, in, in Texas 
it has come through any port of entry and therefore it's unauthorized. So the goal there is just detecting and stopping it. And that really means domain awareness, sort of eyes on the ground. Right? Uh, at the ports of entry, mm. it's a very different question because here there's sort of a dual mandate. It's, it's facilitate legal entry and legal commerce mm -hmm. while stopping the bad things. So there the technology that you need is something that enables a customs officer, now called a, a Office of Field Operations Officer, to look inside a container without opening that container mm. and, and with a sufficient degree of resolution that you can tell whether it's contraband or whether it's not, right? Without imposing police state levels of scrutiny on every individual or vehicle coming into the United States and also without creating huge lines, wreaking havoc with the global trading system. I was going to say, that would have a huge so effect on the economy. So I think, <laughs> right, I think there, the, you know, the answer is better, what they call non-intrusive inspection equipment. That's, that's the most important ingredient. I think you may have just answered the next question. I haven't read all of it, but Richard in New York asks, as technology increases the reach and depth of surveillance, how can governments maintain a balance between their need to gather information? Oh, this is, yeah, the well, other big a, issue. And a, a respect issue. for the privacy of individuals. No, I think that's, that's a terrific issue too. And that really takes us away from the trade side of things to the passenger side of things, mm -hmm. especially in the, in the air environment. So the U.S. government has incredibly broad search authority at the border. Uh, they can download your laptop and read through your emails mm -hmm. on mere suspicion that you might be a malefactor of some kind or another, right? That's a sweeping authority that we haven't really talked about, I think, as a society. Do we want the government to have that sort of authority? And it, it goes much beyond that because we have a tremendous amount of information on you mm -hmm. when you enter the country. We know mm -hmm. where you've traveled. We know what credit card you used to buy your ticket. We know your entire flight itinerary, et cetera, and a bunch of other things about you that we could theoretically fuse together mm -hmm. and assess your risk. That's incredibly important for us to do because it means we can focus law enforcement on the few people who really pose a high risk, the, the one to three percent of people who are not compliant in some way with all legal, right, and not hold up the other 95, 97, 99 percent of right. passengers. But fusing all that information together raises civil liberties issues, mm. right? How much information should the government know about you and how should they be able to, to put it to put it together, to kind of assemble it. It seems to me that we've gotten accustomed to certain levels of intrusion on our privacy already yeah. in, in other contexts. So uh, it amused me no end recently when I was at the grocery store buying a bottle of wine and they actually asked me for ID because they have to ask everybody for ID. But flattering. <laughs> and, yeah. I, I like it when they card me. I think that's, that's, that well, makes my day. It, 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 it would have made my day except that I realized it was totally absurd. They were just following a rule. But, but the point is that yeah. you know we accept that kind of intrusion into our privacy all right. the time. We accept intrusion into our privacy in other contexts. And how much of it is just a question of getting used to that or understanding the need right. better? Understanding the need better or, or having the fulsome public discussion that we've never really had. You know, what level of scrutiny are we willing to tolerate for X additional security, right? So let me, let me give you an example. Immigration information is supposed to cover the lifetime of an individual. Mm -hmm. That means the government retains all the information that has to do with your immigration history for 80 years. Hmm. Okay. One rule of thumb might be the government should only retain information about you as long as it's useful for law enforcement purposes, for instance. So show me the data that reassures me that those last 10 years of data, that we, years 71 through 80, that we retained about you, mm -hmm. who have, by the way, now become a permanent U.S. citizen, mm -hmm. right, is actually valuable for the government. And also, how do we know that information is really being used in the way it, it was originally collected for, right? So that kind of dialogue, we haven't had a discussion. If you adopt a child mm -hmm. from China, you have to surrender a tremendous amount of information mm -hmm. about yourself, including your biometrics, your, your fingerprints. Right? And that goes into a government database. And then it may be used forever for totally different purposes. Right. Even though it was opportunistically collected, you mm -hmm. are not a greater security risk simply because you adopted a child abroad. Right. Right. In fact, you're probably a better person. Right. Right. Than the average person out there for adopting a child abroad. Yeah. Interesting issues. And the and the other the other question that occurs to me is we haven't had that conversation since the world changed post nine one one. 
No, you know, what we had there, there was this, a level of acceptance before, and now it's and now different. it's changed. The environment is different, but but we've adopted a sort of ad hoc set of changes mm. in policy without any comprehensive discussion mm. about them. And there are other things that we don't do that yeah. I think almost everybody listening to this broadcast and, and you and I and everyone else in the studio would, would agree we should be doing right. that for whatever reason because of the leftover rule, we mm -hmm. don't do. So for instance, we don't score people who are coming to the country based on the threat they pose. Mm. At least we're not allowed to use that word. Mm -hmm. Scoring. <laughs> scoring is it's, different it's from profiling. 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 It's, a, it's a dirty word to use. Yeah. But in fact, scoring is enormously valuable if it saves the great majority of people time. Right. right? And it's very useful for, for law enforcement purposes. Moreover, we effectively score people now. Mm -hmm. If you're on the no-fly list, you get a score of negative one. Yeah. Right? If you're a member of Global Entry, that's sort of facilitated access mm -hmm. in exchange for giving a lot of information about yourself mm -hmm. as you pass through customs, you score a positive one, everyone else scores a zero. So we have a three-point score. Right? What, what if we made it a 10-point score? Is that really such a tremendous difference in the level of government scrutiny mm -hmm. that we would find it somehow unappealing or illegitimate? So it, go, it goes both ways, but we've just never had, <coughs> never had that conversation. Yeah. All right, I'm going to That was a long answer along. to your question. I'm going to move it? along because I see that we have several other uh, alumni who have weighed in. Uh, Gustavo in Bellarica, um, one of the differentiating aspects of the U.S. compared to less successful countries is its strong institutions and the rule of law. If we decide that the practical reasons of too big to fail too big a problem to detect all drugs, too big to deport all illegal immigrants. Aren't we surrendering our principles of law and become less resilient in the future? That's what we call a leading question, I think, right? It sounds a little bit leading. <laughs> I think I know what country you're talking about. Yes, it's, it's, an, it's an enormous issue. If I were to show you an aerial photograph of the Ciudad Juarez, uh, El Paso area, you would just see a giant urban conglomeration in the middle of the desert, surrounded by, by nothingness, with this little thin ribbon of blue bisecting the city, sometimes lost in the maze of streets, but basically you would see a single city. And in fact, what you have is the most dangerous city in the Western Hemisphere on one hand, see that water is, and one of the safest cities in America, on the other hand, El Paso. So how does that happen? How can one city be divided into two pieces that are so different when it comes to security? And the issue is American law enforcement institutions versus Mexican law enforcement institutions. So I think the right answer here is to do everything in our power to beef up Mexican law enforcement institutions. It's not saying that we have no work to do on our end. It's just saying that the more we can contribute to a, a democratic, prosperous Mexico governed by the rule of law, the better off at the end I think the United States will be. Um, okay. Does that does that cover the question? I, I, yeah, I think I think you actually um, threaded that needle very skillfully. Because this is this is something we could talk about more. If you yeah. know, I don't know. If, do we allow in this forum follow-ups? But it would be fun to have a follow-up. I don't know if we do Online or we don't. Or but offline. we have a cue here, so I'm going to move along. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Jennifer in DC, comprehensive, because I think this is actually a very interesting question myself as well, comprehensive immigration reform has been a lurking topic for several years. And aside from the proposed Hegel-Martinez bill in 2006, we haven't made additional traction in the discussion. Do you think reform is needed? If so, what do you think are our biggest obstacles? Uh, that's, that's a great question. We kind yeah. of covered what I think of as the four pillars of effective comprehensive immigration reform, mm -hmm. right? So there's some measure of reassurance about the porousness or security mm -hmm. of the border, that there's, there's future flows, there's mm -hmm. the population that's already here, and then there's the employer verification mm -hmm. system in what we might call interior mm -hmm. enforcement. Now, how do, how do we get there? Yeah. I, I was a political appointee in the Obama administration, but I'm going to step back and put on my academic hat and just say I think they made a major mistake in the, in the messaging. Uh, they adopted the discourse that the country will be better off and we can pursue comprehensive immigration reform only to the extent that we have first secured the border. Well, mm -hmm. securing the border perfectly is an impossibility. I mean, it, it, with Mexico, it's 1,951 miles, much of it desert, uh, some of it high altitude, uh, very difficult terrain. Th there's no way you're going to seal that border. And I think what we should have said is the border will never be fully secure until we have comprehensive immigration reform. 
until we've limited the flows of undocumented people crossing that border so much that we can really focus law enforcement resources on the, the truly bad guys, drug smugglers, human traffickers, criminals, terrorists, etc. So um, that's a really interesting answer. It sort of flows into the next question as well, which is about what rights does ICE have for inspection, interrogation, not at the border, for instance, but for travel within the United States. And yep. so, you know, talking about making uh, our own policies, right. the so, right policies, that goes to that question. That's, that's also a very good question. Just So it's not all inside baseball. ICE is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. It's a different agency from the one I, I worked at. It, it, if you think of uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection as basically being the, the patrol cops, ICE are the homicide detectives. So ICE handles all the immigration and customs related uh, investigations inside the United States. So mm. they're, they're doing domestic enforcement, but they're doing investigations. So if somebody uh, is an employing an illegal uh, immigrant, mm. they would be the ones that would come in and investigate that it? That would be ICE. Okay. Right. That, that would be ICE. And uh, ICE right now has made the decision that it's going to focus its resources on the, quote, criminal aliens. That is, people in the United States who have been convicted, especially if they've been convicted of a felony. Many of them are now in jail you know, state, local, or federal, and at the end of their sentence, ICE is going to spend a lot of time making sure they get deported, rather than just running back onto the street and disappearing again into society, because they have no right to say in the United States they're here illegally, and they've also committed a crime. Presumably, they're highly undesirable. We want to, we want to get them out of the country. The, well, that, that group of people, simply deporting that group of people, will occupy almost all of ICE's enforcement resources for the foreseeable future, mm -hmm. right? And they have precious little then to expend on wh what we think of as normal mm -hmm. immigration enforcement, right? Yeah. Some people think that's great because that means there'll be no ICE raids, right? Right. There, there won't. Right. There won't be people showing up at the at the Walmart arresting people, or arresting your gardener, right? Yeah. Or who's you, there looking for day labor? Right. <laughs> right. Um, on on the other hand, it means that no one is really doing the interior immigration mm. enforcement that so many people are hungry for. Yeah. So it's sort of a, it's a, it's a two-way street. Yeah. So Lila in Washington asks, you've talked about what the strategy, what strategy would be effective. What do you think is likely to happen to stem illicit trade and traffic? And I think that's sort of related to another yeah. question we had yeah. about yeah. sort of in this political climate. Yeah. No, so Lila was actually listening to what we were talking about. I think that so. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a positive. Sign. Uh, you know, government moves very slowly. In some sense, it's designed to move very slowly. At, at U.S. Customs and Border Protection, as I mentioned, it's a 58,000 person organization. There are four senior political appointees, only one of whom is Senate confirmed. So, so on the one hand, it's very nicely insulated from political pressure. On the other hand, it's very hard to change. And the same is true of all the other components of, of DHS. So. The best prediction of what we're going to do in the future, I think, is what we've done in the past on, on the law enforcement side, for better or for worse. Uh, in terms of uh, comprehensive immigration reform, I just politically, I don't have a crystal ball, but my prediction would be nothing is going to happen, certainly not before the elections, and, and maybe not for quite a while. We've had two big runs at this, one under George W. Bush and another one then, not, not quite as big a run at it, but, but an attempt to, to sound out, to do a whip count under the Obama administration, and we haven't. We haven't seen yet the, the, the evidence that this is something that Congress is willing to pass. So I guess I'm not optimistic in the short term politically. So our next question is... And that's not good news. I know that's yeah. not the answer that you want to hear or you want to hear, but... It's, I think it's yeah. expected. It's expected. You know, yeah. and the, on the drug policy thing, I, yeah. for 30 years now we've had a particular drug enforcement focus, yeah. which was on supply. Yeah. interdiction, not on demand control. And that's shifting very gradually, yeah. but we're not getting the sort of paradigm shifting dramatic change that we probably need. In you have policy. to manage both sides. Yeah, you have to manage both sides. And I think the big disconnect here is that it's easy for uh, elected representatives mm -hmm. to look like they're doing something vigorous on the counter-narcotics issue by investing more at the border or investing more in the shipping lanes, right, right trying to interdict mm -hmm. traffic, or mm -hmm. even in the source countries themselves, and mm -hmm. say where coca is being grown in the islands of, of Peru, rather than putting the law enforcement resources in the United States where we might 
catch a couple college kids experimenting <laughs> with illegal substances, right? And so politically, it's easier to do yeah. this, 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 the first rather than the second, even though the second is what's going to be more effective. It's often easy. It, it, often, the more difficult thing is the more effective. Right. <laughs> and this is certainly one of the cases where that where that's true. Okay, yeah. we, we're, we're going to run out of time soon, so I want to move along, and this is a little bit of a change of direction here. Larry in Massachusetts asks, what about the virtual tunnels from beyond or within our borders, the threat of Stuxnet-style attacks on critical infrastructure? You're going to have to tell me what Stuxnet yeah. is. Yeah. Um, Project Aurora demonstrated the feasibility back in 2007, and I designed a malicious software attack on the power industry back in 2003 use it used in novel web games. This would seem to be a much bigger security issue than illegal immigration. I, I take it he means that his he designed it either as part of a game I or, hope so. or under contract with the, <laughs> I the people who so. are being attacked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If not, you yeah. know, save what his is, identifiers. What is Stuxnet <laughs> first? I, you know, this is beyond my area of expertise. Okay. I, have, I have to be honest. I haven't, I haven't done cybersecurity. There's a whole set of people in the U.S. government, both in the uniformed services and the military and on the civilian side who really focus on this and I'm you know I'm sorry to punt uh, on your question but uh, I don't know enough about cybersecurity to really engage except to know that it's a huge issue mm -hmm. right and, and a major vulnerability as you say and I know that the problem there is not just the threat of hackers or, 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 or terrorists certainly not but but rather of nation states I mean there are other countries that have dedicated tremendous resources to making sure that they could bring down the economy of a country that adopted hostile policies toward them, and the United States is, is vulnerable in that regard, no question. All right, this will have to be our last question, I think. Um, a. Tang in Hong Kong. It seems that a secure border depends on information sharing between DHS, CIA, FBI, and other agencies. What is the status of the cooperation among the relevant agencies? <laughs> that Agen written agencies by that are designed yeah. to keep secrets are expected to now open I think the door and share it with everybody. I think that question might have been written by someone on my staff in Washington. <laughs> I, I, uh, what happened after 9-11 was a, a tremendous reorganization of government efforts mm. in the realm of, of counterterrorism. Mm -hmm. right? that, that all those information sharing barriers really were broken down. Mm. And the same has not happened on the law enforcement side. Mm -hmm. Law enforcement agencies, especially the investigative yeah. agencies, like the FBI, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Huge Firearms, and Explosives, battles. DEA, they do not like to share their toys in the sandbox. Right? They don't. Mm -hmm. And especially they don't like to share their toys with what we think of as the interdiction agencies, mm -hmm. Customs and Border Protection, and uh, the U.S. Coast Guard. Because in sharing information, they might compromise an ongoing investigation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. some small fry in their mind who is involved in a larger criminal conspiracy might be apprehended crossing the border and that might disrupt the case they're building to take down the larger organization. Right. This is a huge, huge issue and uh, one of the biggest issues I think is to make sure that information inside the, the Drug Enforcement Agency, which is quite extensive, is really adequately shared in a way that doesn't compromise ongoing investigations. For instance, information that comes out of uh, closed cases cases that are no longer active could be of tremendous value to the rest of the law enforcement community and hasn't yet been marshaled in that service. Okay, I lied before. We actually have one more question. <laughs> one more question is great. This is the That's last right. one. That's this right. is the last, the last of the last. Then do I get to ask you questions? Is that uh, Only right? after no. the mics are turned okay. off. <laughs> um, Tim in Colorado asks us, why is the emotional volume so high on immigration issues? You point out that most immigration is lawful and little violence actually spills over the Mexican-U.S. border. Uh, you know, I think it's a great question, and I'm, I'm actually not sure why, why the volume is so high. It's somehow it strikes a chord. On both sides, there are people who think anti-immigration enforcement actions are somehow discriminatory against one ethnic group or another, and there are other people who think, wow, the, you know, the, the country's ours, we have to build a wall and stop any people who are coming in illegally. I don't think that really what's driving this is tremendous concern about loss of jobs. And I, it's not clear to me at all. What about that money? The count, well, it's, I mean, it's just on the jobs front. I, I don't think it's being driven by the threat that someone coming from abroad will take away a, a, the job of an American worker. So I'm not totally sure I fully understand the reason that the, the, the issue has so much emotional salience. I do know it receives a great deal of coverage on Fox News. Mm. And that, 
that may well, have something to do with it. It seems to me there may also be a lot of misinformation floating around, floating around, and you probably know if it's misinformation or not, about how much illegal immigrants actually cost us in terms of social services, law enforcement, right. Medicare, schools, well, and the, all and of the, those things. And the cost is almost entirely a function of them being here illegally. Right. If they were legal, they then presumably they would be paying taxes. So there's, mm. a, there's an easy way to It's never counteract, presented that way, yeah, however. counteract that argument. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. On behalf of the MIT Alumni Association, I would like to uh, thank Professor Lawson for offering his insights uh, and our viewing audience for joining this interactive session. Thank you for participating. We encourage you to continue discussing the uh, issues, the immigration issues on our blog, Slice of MIT. Follow the link that it should be appearing on your screen now or shortly. Anyone who registered for this webcast will also receive a link to a short survey. Please take a moment to fill this out. Your feedback is important as we work to expand this programming. Thank you for watching. Our intent is to hold these programs eight times a year at the end of the month and hope you will join us for the next Faculty Forum online webcast to be held at the end of January. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.